Hey everybody, welcome to today's video. We're going to be talking about tax-free retirement income. I love this topic because it's so misunderstood. So I want to set the record straight as to what does it actually mean when advisors start talking about tax-free income. I think they're talking about something that you may have heard before, but it ended up being something else. When you think about tax-free income, it has, I think, so many people associated that, that phrase or that, that word with scams like Ponzi schemes, um, offshore banking, multi-level marketing, get-rich-quick schemes. And so this is something that I want to set the record straight. When advisors are talking about tax-free income, what they're really talking about is how to take a, an asset that is fully taxable right now and turning it into a non taxable income stream for you. That's what it means about tax-free income. So it's not it's not trickery and it's not a scam. It's being able to take something that you're currently paying tax on and turning it into a tax-free income or in this case, non-taxable income. So this is what I want to set you straight. This is what we're going to be talking about today. It's going to be not a long video because I'm going to get into straight into the detail about how we do this. But I'm not going to go into the details of boring you with uh, tables and tax tables. None of that nonsense. If you really want to know that, I'm happy to share with that with you on a one-on-one -on -one session. But today I'm going to be just sharing with you about how we go about helping you uh, turn a taxable um, income to a non-taxable income. So what I want to do right away is just to change your perception or change the way you think about this. When you see or hear the word tax-free income, I want you to replace that with a non-taxable income, okay? Just change the your vocabulary around that sentence because the word income is what I want you to pay attention to. This is what's really most important for advisors is we're focusing on how money is taxed in Canada. This is really important for you. Okay, so the economic system is set up on three assumptions. One is that you're going to get a great education, then you're going to find a great career and get paid a lot of money, hopefully, and then, of course, you're going to pay taxes. This is the way governments around the world, almost all of the governments around the world, are set up so that everybody gets a good education, learns something, goes into the workforce, and pays taxes. That is the way the world goes around, so to speak. But there are actually two different worlds. There are the, the world that you and I and so many millions, billions, in fact, of people around the world are plugged into that system. And there, then there are the wealthy. And the wealthy understand something that we don't or maybe think that we just can't. Like it's sort of out of our grasp or it's something that's not meant for us. And here's what I'm going to share with you today. You know, there's a lot of talk around taxing the rich. You know, have the rich pay their fair share of taxes. You know, now I go, oh! Oh, ha, ha! oh beautiful! <laughs> have you guys heard this one? Oh! <laughs> you laugh that way because you know you're wealthy, is that? I'm very wealthy, and that, that's... That's, odd. I That's how wealthy people laugh. I wouldn't have oh! <laughs> Poor rich people. Um, they have enough money. They should be able to let go some of their money and, and solve all of our problems. And, well, here is the problem. Wealthy people understand how money is taxed. That's why they have more money. It's because they understand what the government is doing. You see, when we go back to this last slide and we say wealthy people understand how money is taxed. So they're actually coming at it from a different angle. They're not coming from an angle where we say get educated, start working in a job and pay income tax. They're looking at it from a completely different point of view. They're looking at, well, what does that mean that the government is going to tax our income? So let's look at just a quick reminder of what that means. Employment. You're either working for somebody earning a salary or you are the employer so you have a small business and you are or you're self-employed and so it's a completely different kind of tax model for you if you're eventually going to receive a pension income that means Canada pension plan old age security and perhaps maybe an employer pension and then there's investment income interest income so you bonds GICs 
uh, doing mortgage lending, that's interest income, dividend, capital gains, and rental income. So that gives you sort of an idea of how income, incomes are sort of divided up for the government. And they tax these sources of income completely different. And what's really important to note is salary and interest income are the two worst things. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm beating everybody up that's watching this video. Hey, I work for um, a company. I get paid a salary. There's nothing wrong with that. What I'm trying to say to you is that when you actually are paid a salary, you are um, being taxed. This is the graduated income tax schedule for or the federal income tax schedule for Canada. And you can see is as you earn more money, you're taxed more <laughs> income tax. And this is what the rich know. The rich understand this, that, oh, if I earn a salary, I get I have to pay income tax. If I earn interest income, that gets lumped into this and I have to pay at my the highest marginal tax rate. Now I'm on to you. The rich figure this out. So why do you need to know this? Because wealthy people understand how money is taxed. They understand there's these forms that we have to fill in, basically filing your income tax. And it says, what are the sources of income tax that you have for the year? I know I'm, I'm sort of making this sound simple, but it kind of goes with the strategy of how I explain things because I really don't think we need to take complex problems and, and talk them in a complex way. I like to make them as simplified as possible. So the rich understand the government is saying, put your sources of income and we'll tax you a certain way. Well, the government is telling you, they're screaming at you, they're advertising it to you that we're going to tax you if you have these types of income. What does the rich people and the wealthy people do? Well, they decide, well, then if you're going to tax me on this source of income, I don't want that kind of income. Wealthy people are going to ask, how do I use my money without paying tax? So back to this slide, you're going to fill in your tax return and you're going to have to put in your sources of income and all of those sources of income are fully taxable. Government is saying, look, we're playing by the same rules. Everybody fills in this form and everybody puts in their, their sources of income and everyone goes back to this slide. Everyone falls into this category of how much federal tax and there's some deductions. Okay. But everybody, this is, everybody's in the same boat, except if you're a business owner or a small business owner, self-employed, it's slightly different. You have a lot more deductions available to you than someone who's just receiving a salary working for somebody else. But the idea here is everybody is, is playing by the same rules, but the wealthy people have figured out that you don't actually have to have this kind of income. So they're asking, well, how do I use my money without paying tax? So you know what that's called? It's called this buy, borrow and die. It's very clever, but it's so close. It's so close to the truth. You're not going to believe this. And I'm going to share with you exactly how this works. Okay. This is a typical kind of asset allocation. When we say asset allocation, it's a big word for being able to say, put all your assets into one pile, in this case, in a pie chart, and let's divide it up in terms of percentages. And that orange is real estate. So real estate could be your, your personal residence, your cottage, your condo, uh, real estate investments that you might have. Equity, that blue area, that represents stocks. So what you might have in a stock portfolio. Fixed income, the green area. Well, the fixed income really means bonds, government Canada bonds, corporate bonds, provincial bonds, GICs, even cash. And so this is really important for you to understand that what we're talking about today is this green area. This is fixed income. Remember back before when I said those two areas, salary and interest income are taxed the highest. So interest income is taxed at your highest marginal tax rate. Well, interest income is in that fixed income category. It's bonds, corporate bonds, government of Canada bonds, GICs. They're all taxed at the highest marginal tax rate. This and they all have the lowest rate of return. This is really important for you to understand. So what we're going to be doing is trading the fixed income part of your assets for participating life insurance. And you know, you're like, whoa, 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 you're going to, you're just trying to sell me life insurance. Hear me out. This is why we do this because the wealthy understand how to use their money in a different way. And this is very clever. The idea here is to not have this type of income 
fixed income. You don't want to have that on your return because it's at your highest marginal tax rate. So let's look at how this would work. And before I do that, I'll just share with you like why am I focusing on this? Because if you look at this, this is the historical rate of return for just income. I'm not counting equities. So when we're talking about so many people are in a balanced portfolio, so you have 60% of your money in equities and 40% in fixed income. So we're talking about that wedge, that 40%, this here, okay? The, if you are 100% fixed income, the, the historical from 1926 to 2019 is 5.33%. 10% um, fixed income, or sorry, 90% fixed income, 5.99. We go down to 80%, 6.62 and then 7.21% for 70% fixed income. Now what's important to know is that is pre-tax returns. If you think about when I said to you that fixed income, the income that you have to report is at your highest marginal tax rate. So the pre-tax, this is a pre-tax rate of return. So think about getting 3.5%, 3%, 4%, this is really ugly. And then when you factor in inflation at 2%, you're barely making any money. In fact, this is from 1926 to 2019. If you're just to look at the last 10 years of returns for fixed income, in many cases, you're seeing negative returns right now. And so the case for, for fixed income is it's necessary because if you notice here, the best year 30, we'll just look at the 100%, okay? Best year is 32%. But what's important to look at here is the years with a loss. So under the 100% fixed income, look at the last one at the top it says, years with a loss, 14 of 94. 94 years and only 14 of them had a loss. So this is why fixed income is so important in a portfolio because it actually is um, experiencing far less negative returns than equities would over the same period, right? And those, those negative returns are really small by comparison. Think of 2008 when the Toronto stock market um, was down 35%. Think of 2020 during COVID when the stock market again went down more than 30%. Fixed income doesn't behave in that, that uh, regard. So this is why it's important for a portfolio to last your retirement in that it's going to save you in the years that there are negative returns. But nonetheless, why do you have to just agree to have a 3%, like in this particular case, on average after-tax return of 3 or 3.5%, three you're almost wasting your money here. And so you don't really want to be in that position. That's why wealthy people trade their fixed income for participating life insurance. And I'm going to get into that right now. Okay, how would this work for you if you are not self-employed, you don't own a business, you're just working for a company and you have a salary? There you are, you are a high income earner and you would have obviously RSPs, tax-free savings accounts, but you would also have a large non-registered investment portfolio. And the problem with that is you're going to diversify, you're going to have some equities and some fixed income. So I'm going back to that pie chart, we're talking about that part of it. You're going to take that, that wedge that's fixed income wedge, and you're going to start depositing into participating life insurance. There's your cash value going into the life insurance. It's being protected inside the life insurance, earning a rate of return. But every year, the life insurance company provides an annual dividend. That gets lumped into the same place where you've put your cash, and all of that money is growing. And you could say right now that that money is growing at, say, 5%. That's what the dividend represents. And that money is growing how? It's growing tax-free. There's that word again, tax-free. That means that as long as the money is held inside of the life insurance policy, it can grow and compound on itself at around 5% per year, and you pay absolutely zero tax. So you don't have to report any of that to, to Canada Revenue Agency, CRA. You don't have to report that. It's all you're going to get at the end of a year or your policy year is you're going to get a statement that shows how much your cash value went up in value, but you don't have to report it. That's awesome. So now it's kind of like a tax-free savings account. You put your money in a tax-free savings account, it grows, but you don't have to report any of that growth, right? Similarly here with life insurance, participating life insurance, that money goes into the life insurance and grows tax-free. Now you have a pool of cash that you had in a non-registered portfolio being fully taxed, earning after tax, 
maybe 3%, and you're not at one time, year over year, you're depositing this money into your participating life insurance getting about 5% with zero tax. After a while, what you're going to do is you're going to take this to a bank and you're going to use that cash in your life insurance as collateral for a loan that's going to come back to you. And you can take that money and use that money any way you like because it's also going to be non-taxable income. There is the first part of what we talked about. We're taking a fully taxable asset and turning it into a non-taxable income stream for yourself. Use that money any way you like. If you actually take that money and invest it, then that loan can become tax deductible, further enhancing the power of leverage here and using your own cash value in your life insurance. Now, the other thing that's happening simultaneously while you're using this money in your life insurance policy, the life insurance policy is unaffected by what you're doing with the bank. That's a separate issue that you're doing with the bank. The life insurance policy is still having an annual dividend and it's still growing by around 5% per year. That's the annual dividend. Uh, companies, one company over another, the, the annual dividend might be more or less, but just to make this a very simple conversation, your, your cash value continues to grow while you're actually leveraging it and using it to do whatever you want with it, right? And it's yours. So you can either do one big loan or you could do um, loans each year as you like. And that's something that you would negotiate with the bank. Right now it's around, the loan rate is around um, 1.25 to 1.5%. Plus, that's uh, prime plus 1.25%. So it's very affordable. So in, in fact, if you were getting, let's say 5% dividend and it was only costing you about 4 or 4.5%, in terms of, uh, and you didn't write it off, you're still making money, <laughs> you're still plus, which is remarkable. Okay, what if you were a business owner, small business owner, this corporate structure might look familiar to you. For those of you that don't understand or don't have small businesses, I'll explain it very slowly and you'll understand. Holco, that is their holding company, that, which owns the operating company, that's where you have your active assets. And of course, that triangle is, that's you. You're the owner of those particular corporations. You are going to have an investment company. So we call that Invesco. And inside of that corporation, you have your non-active assets. This is really important. I won't get into that, but you can watch this video up here that talks about making sure you don't go offside with your lifetime capital gains exemption. That's why you would have a separate corporation. But essentially what's happening is your operating company is pushing money to your corporation. You're allowed to transfer between Canadian controlled corporations money to other corporations that you own, and it's a non-taxable event. So the cash goes from your operating company over to this Invesco, and it purchases life insurance on you, the owner. So that is where those deposits are going, money going into the life insurance policy. Now, this next phase is almost identical to what we just did when we had it just personally set up. The insurance company is now gonna to go to the bank and we're gonna say, we would like to use the cash that we have in the life insurance policy as collateral for a loan to me, the shareholder, that I'm gonna use any way I like. I'm not gonna get into some of, there's some other um, um, issues around how you do that, but it, when, we, um, when you call me up or you wanna talk one-on-one, -on -one, I'll explain how that works, but essentially it's the same thing. You're going to take that money that was in your corporation, is now in a life insurance policy, and you now collateralize it and use it as a loan. And guess what? It becomes a non-taxable income stream to you. Use it any way you like. And this is perfectly legal. There's nothing illegal about this. People are doing this. Business owners are doing this every single day of the week. And why is this important for you to understand this? Because Wealthy people understand that the government set up all these tax tables and said, we're going to tax you on income. Well, what's important for you to understand is that wealthy people don't earn income. They purchase assets and turn those assets into non-taxable income streams. This is why taxing the rich just doesn't work. And this is why we go back to the buy, borrow and die, because this is what they're doing. They're buying really a non-taxable income stream. They're buying an asset, they borrow against it, 
and then they die. But when they borrow against it, they use that money to either buy more assets or just create an income stream so that funds their lifestyle. It's up to them what they do with that money. There's no restrictions on it. So let's go into this so you understand. Loans are not income. And because they're not income, they're not taxable. This is really important for you to understand. Because if you can manage, and you don't have to have a lot of money to do this kind of strategy. You just have to be insurable. Obviously, that's important. And you have to have stable cash flow. So you, something about this strategy you should know, and that is, it's not like it's an RSP where you can stop and start. Once you start it, you got to keep funding it. And that's really important for you to know. So it's not for everybody. But for people who have stable cash flows and who are building a non-registered investment portfolio, you understand that if you are buying fixed income, what a drag it is to have such poor returns. But you're thinking, what else can I do? Well, here I'm just showing you exactly what else you can do. So this is really important. So what happens though at death? So your participating life insurance policy will pay off the loans and whatever is remaining, which is usually quite a bit still, goes to your beneficiaries tax-free. So in this particular case, whether it was done personally, if it's personally, it just pays off the loan and the remaining amount goes to your beneficiaries that you've named in the, ta in the life insurance. And if it's uh, through your corporation, pays off the loans and the death benefit goes into your capital dividend account of your bank account, of your corporation and that flows through to the heirs of your estate on a tax-free basis. So this is why it's such a powerful tool for you to be able to use. Um, to think about how you can turn your non-registered assets that are you're paying tax and at a high marginal tax rate into a non-taxable income stream. I hope you love this uh, video. If you did get a lot out of it, please remember to hit that like button and go on up into my uh, YouTube account and look at all the other videos because I post about two videos a week plus a live stream. Live stream is uh, every Wednesday evening at seven o'clock, so tune into that. I like to tell people we take care of your wealth management so you can take care of what's most important to you. This is so important. I believe that these kinds of things are uh, important, that you, you uh, work with a, an advisor that can manage your money and hit all of your financial planning goals so that you can spend more time with the people you love and care about and doing the things that you wanted to do with your, your with your life and not having to worry about managing your money at the same time. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to, to watch this video. I had a great time presenting this topic to you. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks very much and take care.